approach anything on Wilton straight? Uh, we'll know more. It's, it's going to depend uh, just how he feels. Okay. And then Jeremy Clark, uh, can you talk about his progress as he had the surgery? And have you guys started the petition at all with him for the sixth year? Yeah, um, he's doing good. Uh, surgery was successful, and uh, be, there's a process. Um, uh, where it is in the process is he's gathered in, in the gathered in information, making a case, and, and it'll be submitted soon. Jim, uh, with with Wilton, um, when do you think you'll have to know to make a decision on him, and how is it kind of a, a game time decision with him at this point? Could be. So, and it's his As shoulder. Said, you know, when we'll know is you know based on um, you know, what the doctors say and and how wh how Wilton's feeling, what he's able to do during the week in terms of practice, et cetera. And it's just shoulders, all right? Um, as I said, we'll, we'll make that determination with the doctors and with Wilton. Just one, one fight. Do, do you at least know if there's anything structural done, or is it just a soreness thing? Can you Have you been able to determine that yet on Wilton? Um, as always, you know, per, per our principle, we don't go into the specifics. If need be, John O'Corn, have you seen enough of him through the practice to be confident in him? Yes, yes. Um, John, Shane, uh, you know, I especially uh, would anticipate uh, today, the next couple of days, uh, at least that they'll get the majority of the reps and and um, be good practice for him. But they've they've all they've both had extensive practice time the course of the year and yes we are confident they will do a good job here Justin coach nobody likes to lose but can it sometimes help refocus a group knowing that you guys still control your own destiny and, and get you back and maybe see a reinfused or reignited focus going into this week <clears throat> well I, I really thought our focus last week uh, and every week, going into every game is, has been a positive. And you're right, nobody, I know for sure, can speak for ourselves, we don't like to lose either. Down in front here, John. Coach, what's your understanding of when you can hit a punter that's rolling out? Uh, when, he, when he's outside of the, taking enough steps to be outside of the tackle box, is my understanding. Did you think that play should have I not thought he was been clearly called? outside of the tackle box, yeah. When you lose a game, it's just the first loss of the year, but when you lose a game, it, how do you balance? Do you, do you look at things, changes personnel-wise, or do you view it as one tight loss and not overreact, but you don't want to underreact either? How do you, how do you deal with it? Um, the, you come back Monday, today's Monday, uh, you know, with a enthusiasm to make sure, darn, you know, the, got a really good ball club coming in, in Indiana, it's a big game, um, that's, uh, that's how we look at it, we got to get prepared, uh, so we can play our best this Saturday, that's the mindset. Just to follow up to that, the fact that Everything is still out there, the Big Ten title, everything else. Does that certainly help to keep your players engaged? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the engagement of the players has been, uh, has been a real positive you know, week in, week out. Um, no question about it. Um, the way they prepare, the way they practice, uh, the way they play on Saturday. Uh, you know, habit of winning. Um, and now, uh, now our goal is the same. Um, which is win the next game. Uh, Jim, Chris Evans has gotten off to a pretty quick start, and I'm trying to think off the top of my head, maybe best freshman start since Chris Perry. Can you just, what have you seen th uh, from Chris through the 10 weeks? And is there anything like, I guess when you're giving him instruction, is there anything where you feel like he is just maybe a little bit beyond a freshman as far as comprehension goes? Yeah, I, w I would say that. Uh, I would say that. Uh, then, um, then the uh, the average freshman football player, yes, 
Uh, he's, he's got real knack, instincts, uh, very good, very good learner. Uh, makes that a priority. That's a real positive with him. Uh, you know, it's, it's been plus, plus, plus with Chris. What's Kevin Wilson been doing with Indiana in the time that you've watched them that has been pretty effective? Well, really coaching a good football team, uh, doing, a, doing a very good job. The defense is, is an aggressive, athletic, uh, fast. You know, they create, create turnovers. They tackle extremely well. They cover, um, they cover a lot of the field uh, physically. You know, really good defensive linemen, active, athletic uh, backers that do a lot of the, you know, cause a lot of the havoc um, and, and very good players in the secondary. And they do a good job defensively with the scheme. Uh, they, they are teaching a high volume of scheme to the defense. Um, you know, man, blitz, zone blitz, uh, different variations in the, in the two deep coverages as well as the, the single high... Uh, coverages, uh, twists, uh, multiple zone and blitz patterns, just really, really, uh, or they're getting a lot of, lot done on defense. Uh, offensively, they've, uh, very effective, uh, put a lot of points on the board and, uh, they do a heck of a job. How much did you guys have to adapt not having Devin in there for most of the game? And the linebackers seemed like they were having some challenges. Would would he have been in a rotation there? Yeah, and especially um, he plays a high, high volume of plays on on special teams, and he is the third linebacker. So, I mean, what were the compensation that you guys had to make in terms of that? I mean, did, were there guys who normally just fill that role because you didn't rotate a lot at linebacker with? No, him, right? yeah, with less rotation at linebacker, and um, and we had to replace him on. on not just one person who replaces him, it's different guys on all the different special teams? Yeah, yeah. Um, for the most part, yes. Multiple guys. Yeah, Coach, uh, stopping the run was a little bit of a problem. Uh, are you concerned about uh, the D-line, or uh, it's been a strength uh, yeah. all year? I think it continues to be. Um, you know, you got to win. you got to win two out of the three phases in a football game to win a football game. I thought our defense won uh, you know, the, that phase. Um, offensively, special teams, we uh, did not feel like we won those two phases. And and what usually happens in a ball game, you you don't win the game. But I thought the defense played played winning football and uh, really gave us a chance to to win the game. And and our, our defensive line continues to be uh, a strength. And just one follow up: uh, Do you think you used Jabril enough or too much, or uh, you know, how, how do you feel about uh, his participation? Uh, on Saturday, offensively, yeah, we um, you know we tried several ways to to you know crack open the, the defense to to make plays to get first downs to to score points and um, I think our longest gain in the game was maybe 12 yards in the in the running game. Um, and Jabril had a couple couple real nice plays in there, uh, but as a theme, we didn't. We weren't able uh, to to manufacture enough yards and, and offense. Uh, looking back, I don't have an opinion whether we we used them too much or or not enough to answer your question. In the middle on the right. If, if you do end up needing to go with, with John or Shane, how much does it help that they've been able to get in regularly this year to not have any rust build up? And, and does the offense change at all with either of those guys as opposed to Wilton? I think it's a positive. That, uh, that they've gotten game action. And I want to ask you too about uh, Rashawn Gary. It seems like he's <coughs> quietly helped a lot, but maybe not in the big explosive impact plays that um, people might expect. But how has he grown, I guess, and how much has he helped? And also, how much has Chris Wormley been a uh, impact on him and helping him get settled in this year? Uh, yeah, um, you know, I'd say, like Adam asked about Chris uh, Evans, and I think Rashawn has been a big, big impact as a freshman ahead of, uh, you know, uh, 
average normal uh, production. He has been in on big plays. Uh, you know, he's, he contributes to to a unit that's one of our real strengths on the ball club. Uh, Chris Wormley has been outstanding. Uh, you know, as good a teammate as you could be um, in terms of helping, uh, you know, leading the entire team and and also leading young young players. Is his relationship with Rashawn especially been close or a mentor type thing this year? Yes, I would, from my perspective, it has. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, Chris, Chris is a Chris is a solid guy to everybody. I mean, there's there's um, from my perspective, I don't see him just singling a guy out. Uh, you know, it's a he got strong friendships and bonds with just about everybody on the team. Um, from uh, what I can observe. Front there, Nick. Jim, with the the last field goal they kicked, I think you guys had ten on the field. Yeah. What do you guys hear? What what went wrong there? Was that just a wires cross? What happened there? Yeah, um, we we started with twelve in the huddle, and uh, we um, we were having uh, Demonte Thomas come out, and uh, I believe it was Tyree Cannell. DeMonte came out, and Tyree thought he was supposed to come out as well, but uh, that's what happened. And then my other question was, uh, on the last drive, the last the field goal drive, I think you guys called timeout right before they made a play. Why, what was the reasoning to, to call a timeout there as opposed to maybe holding it? I don't What? just wanted to get your take on that. Yeah. Um, w was hoping to get into, I had two timeouts left, and I uh, was going to use them after second and third down to um, get the ball back with about 30, 35 seconds to go in the game after after the field goal attempt. But when they ran the quarterback draw, made the first down on, on third down, um, you know, knew that that wasn't going to be a, an option anymore. That was that was the intent. We we're trying to get the ball back for last last drive. Um, for the seniors, it'll be their last home game. Can you mm -hmm. just reflect on what this class has meant to you in this program and, and what that's like playing your last game at uh, Michigan Stadium? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's different. Um, remember, uh, remember it pretty well. Um, but this, this class has meant so much uh, to me personally, to Michigan football, to all of us. Uh, yeah, I look at these guys. I mean, it's the direction of the program was was going a certain way, almost like a locomotive. And you know, these these upperclassmen, these seniors, um, and the guys guys last year who played as well. I mean, I mean, it's a lot to get it stopped. You know, to get the momentum stopped, uh, like stopping a freight train. Uh, but you, I credit them uh, for not only getting it stopped, but even harder getting it turned on the tracks and headed headed the other direction. We're gonna go a couple more questions. Start in the middle there, Adam. <clears throat> going back to what you were saying about Indiana's defense, would you say they have more variations on their two deep and single high coverages than what you saw from their defense last year? Uh -huh. Oh, from last year? Uh, yes. Yes, I think so. It's a lot. This is as much as as much as you're gonna see in college football. Jim, when you haven't lost all year and then you lose a game, tight game like this, do you have to do any uplifting of your team, rebuilding, and let them know it's not over, not that bad? Does any of that have to go on at this stage? Uh, yeah, we have to. You have to soldier up. Um, that's what's taking place. And prepare for the uh, a championship game. Pre prepare for uh, a big ball game, but. We'll run the far right, Ryan. Hey, Coach, going back to being the last home game, can you reflect on your senior class and what they have done for this program? I know they've got some more games, but this is their final home game. What they've done in your program, turning things around, and just everything in the last two years uh, in the culmination of your playing their last game at home. Yeah, as, as I said earlier, that's, uh, that's the thing that stands out in my mind the most, uh, and I give – you know, great share of the credit to uh, to this, the guys that are playing in there, you know, in the senior class, in the fifth year class, and guys that were in the 
in the program last year that we're playing uh, uh, as, a, as a greatest share of you know, stopping the stopping the momentum, turning it in a, in a different direction. It's, it's very hard to do, and, uh, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. All right, last question in the front. <coughs> How much discussion do you have with the players or the team as a whole about the rankings and kind of your scenarios in terms of the Big Ten and, and the wider view after the loss? Um, the same. I mean, it takes very little time to see it. You know what you know what they are, and uh, um, you know onward to. You know what they are, but do you tell them? And I, I mean, think they know. I okay. think if you probably asked them, most of them would know. Okay. You know, it's pretty accessible. So, not to answer your question, not a not a. Deep, long conversation necessary now. Okay, thanks. Here are those East Division scenarios. If Michigan wins its final two games, Indiana and Ohio State Wolverines are the Big Ten East rep in Indy. Now, if Penn State wins both of its last two games, they'll be favorites against Rutgers and Michigan State, and Michigan loses once, either Indiana or Ohio State, then Penn State goes because, remember, Penn State beat Ohio State, so they would win a head-to-head -head with the Buckeyes. Buckeyes, meanwhile, need to win out and have Penn State lose to either Rutgers or Michigan State at the end of the year. So those are the East Division scenarios you guys both coached, and you understand what Urban Meyer and Jim Harbaugh are saying. We don't control any of that stuff. All we control is what happens on Saturday afternoon. The viewers can say it's coach speak. I'm tired of listening to it. But it's true, and they're going to try to hammer that into their players over the next two weeks. There's no doubt, especially when you think about if you're Jim Harbaugh and you just got beat Iowa. And going into this game, not a great Iowa team. And you're facing Indiana and Kevin Wilson. We've seen it over the years. He's seen it over the years, and he kept talking about their defense, which has improved. But when they get rolling offensively, watch out. Yeah, and Indiana last week, you know, they were, let's focus in on Michigan, you know, because they control everything at this point, truly. And, you know, last week was, was a, a closer game with Indiana with Penn State than maybe what anybody realizes. I mean, that thing wasn't won until the last few minutes in the fourth quarter. So Kevin Wilson's going to have his team ready to play, and Jim knows that. Yeah, Ohio State and Michigan with a little bit to worry about before that November 26th date now because we always assume that even the loser would have an opportunity to get into the college football playoff. Perhaps that scenario is no longer the case. We'll discuss that and all sorts of playoff scenarios coming up on Big Ten Football and Beyond. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hour-long edition of the show comes your way right after this short break.